Welcome. Um, today we are here to do a type nine Enneagram panel. And my name is Mickey Scappe Jones, um, she, her pronouns, and I'm an Enneagram teacher and coach. Um, and I'll be facilitating this panel today by asking these lovely humans who all identify as personality type nine about themselves and their experiences of living life as that with their dominant type. So I will start by offering a little, you know, about the type nine, a little bit of a personality profile, but then we'll really broaden our understanding by hearing from the panelists who are truly the experts in their type. So type nine, there's usually a whole lot of love for type nine uh, within Enneagram circles. Uh, they are known as the mediator or the peacemaker or the moderator, really think someone who can see all sides of an issue or even a disagreement. And typically they are motivated to keep the peace um, through harmony, through avoiding conflict. This type's basic belief being that they can gain belonging and comfort by substituting their own worth for like a blending or merging with others. So they tend to disperse their energy into other things and people, which then kind of creates a, a kind of inertia, um, like just, you know, kind of keeping things at the same pace, not putting on the gas, not pulling back, but let's keep it the same, kind of treading water. But if you think about it, treading water can be exhausting. So, you know, in fact, what we see is that type nines can have this kind of self-forgetting tendency. Um, this like not really being in touch with their own priorities or even their own limits at times because they just want things to be smooth and harmonious for others and for the environment. So sometimes the way we talk about it is that nines have, have lost touch with that kind of original sense of unconditional love where everyone, including themselves, matter enough to be included. And that deep knowing has been covered with a sense that they are unimportant and actually have to blend in in order to belong and be loved. So it's just really easy for this type, for the focus of the attention to be on what others need or want. Um, they really have that outward focus. Uh, and it's not that they're lazy as sometimes they are stereotyped. I really hate the stereotype of nines as as lazy or just kind of sitting around because it's not like that. Um, it's more that that, that energy is diffuse, um, that the energy is spread out and they're kind of attuned or attending to the frequencies of others in their orbit. Um, and they tend to be focused on present time and preoccupied with a predictability and a structure to their lives. <clears throat> um, so, Type nines, like I said, you know, can see all those different points of view um, and kind of hold equally compelling ideas in their mind at once, which is a talent and a skill. And right now, culturally, that would be a lovely skill for more people to have. Um, and they tend to contain their anger. Um, and the way I like to talk about it is they contain their anger in a box with a lid and that lid does not come off. Um, because of their dedication to maintaining a comfortable, familiar life. And anger is disruptive. It's unpredictable. And for many of us, it can even feel dangerous. So type nines are often experienced as caring, attentive, empathetic. They are known to be giving and adaptive and supportive, just steady and receptive people which is why everybody loves them. Um, they are willing to participate and have this non-judgmental -jud way of being. But the flip side is that this often easygoing personality is that they, they can go along to get along and then later realize that they resent it and resist, leading to kind of this passive aggressiveness or a sullenness or a stubbornness even. And they can also lean towards choosing what's comfortable instead of what is actually important to them. Um, because they're so out of touch with what's important to them, that can even cause them to miss opportunities and then 
that creates that cycle, right? Like that feeling of being unimportant or left out just gets confirmed. So um, if, as we think about nines in relationship, um, sometimes nines can cause confusion by saying yes, when they really mean to say no, or maybe, uh, and then they realize later that they only said yes to keep the peace. <clears throat> and so nines, um, you know, they are known as being chill and they show up as physically chill, as relaxed, non-excitable, um, and, and may also have difficulty with, with boundaries. Like they can be kind of our, our, our cuddle buddies. Um, and so the work of the nine can really be rediscovering that they matter and that what they want, what they desire uh, matters. And then they become more fluent in taking action that comes from that deepest desire instead of just what comes from what's comfortable or what causes no or little friction. Um, and then that ability to hold all of these points of view so gracefully and consider the needs of the collective can really be valuable contributions um, as they lead with love for an inclusion of themselves alongside everybody else. Um, and then they bring that aligned action to really get things done in compassionate ways in the world. So we all experience some of these traits in type nine, um, but the panelists here today know what it's like to experience this as their dominant type. So before we hear from them, let's take a moment to just feel into our own experience and connect to the type nine personality structure uh, through a short centering exercise. So I'm gonna invite you now, panelists and anybody watching, just to get comfortable in whatever way works for you. you close your eyes if you want. You don't have to, of course. You can always find somewhere to gaze. And just take a moment to slow down, to notice your breath. And to feel your sits bones on wherever you're sitting. Maybe feel your feet against the surface they're on. Just reminding yourself that you're here in your body. And that you are in control of you. And maybe take a deep breath. If you feel like you need a little extra air in your lungs. Mm. And remember how good it feels when there is true peace and harmony inside of ourselves. And see if there's a place inside you where you touch into that sense of peace that comes from being deeply aligned with who you are. And if you haven't felt that way in a while, maybe just imagine what it's like to feel that peace inside. And as we open up to hear the stories, the narratives of what it's like to lead with this personality type, let us be open to the places of resonance and hold respect and space for the places where we are different. And now as we come back to our time together, open your eyes, you can wiggle and just welcome back. So Nines, it's so great to talk with you. Um, I feel like you're the favorites of the Enneagram. People will sometimes say jokingly and sometimes not, you know, Jesus was a nine. And I'm like, well, I don't know if we should go around typing Jesus Christ, but I feel like it's definitely a type that gets a lot of love um, and, and sometimes can then 
you know, people don't know the realities of what it's like inside you, the things that you also struggle with or that feel like they don't work for you. Um, so I really want to hear from you today. And the first question is, um, how did you know that you were a type nine or what kind of resonated with you from either descriptions you've read or what you heard me say today? Just how did you know that that was your kind of main personality type? Who wants to start? I can. Um, Thanks, I'm trying to remember because my Enneagram journey has been, it's been a while now. Mm -hmm. um, but before I learned of Enneagram, I did the Myers-Briggs testing. And that one put me at INFP, which is, you know, the peacemaker, depending on which one you look at, like in the peacemaker. And that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And then I did, you know, one of the fun, handy online testings for Enneagram and it came up with nine and reading everything about it. Um, you know, like a lot of the stuff that you said, you know, the just wanting to keep peace. And I've said that about, you know, like my role as mom, um, is I feel like I'm just constantly moderating, like just, yeah. can everyone get along? Like, please, do we have to fight? Do we have to yell? Like, you know, and kids are going to do that. Like they're going to, that's just part of, you know, development of, of kids. Um, you know, but then I also find that I do that, you know, in friend groups and, you know, so many things that, you know, just, I think mainly the, the peacekeeping, the moderating, um, was the first thing that stuck out at me. Yeah. Yeah. Do you also like remember ways you did that even in your younger years, like coming up, like you were always kind of, okay, nice. Well, the hard part about that, and this may be a topic for another day, I don't know, um, is my, I also had to try to detangle some of the ways of the nine, because I also have a lot of, um, my mother was very emotionally abusive. Mm -hmm. And so trauma, like when you hear people talk about, you know, things that are trauma responses, a lot of it can be very nine Ask. Yeah. So then trying to untangle which part of me is nine and which part of this is a trauma response. You know, so what part am I needing to heal and what part am I needing to embrace? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's a journey that I'm on right now. Um, so that's kind of hard, like looking back because I don't know how much my trying to keep the peace and trying to go with the flow as a young child was just my nature. Oh. And how much of it was a response to my environment? Okay. Well, I mean, and that's even helpful to bring up because when we, when we talk about personality, personality is what is built up around your essence. So it is part of how you learn to survive, right? The strategies, the well-worn kind of pathways that you learned how to navigate, right? So right. it develops and we develop these strategies because they work in the moment. You know, there was something about becoming a peacemaker, about kind of tune, being very tuned in to every, what everybody else needed and how to keep all of that happy and how to try just not to need that mm -hmm. kept you safe, right? Mm -hmm. Beginning to unpack that and figure out, well, how, what do I still want to keep? What still works for me is how we actually work with our ego, work with our personality, instead of just feeling like we're along for the ride. Right. I hear you. Like that is a, that's a big part of doing our work with the Enneagram. It goes beyond just identifying with a type. Right. To beginning to unpack it and use, use this knowledge, um, for our good. So you're, you're jumping right in there. Thank you for that, Kelly. Okay. Who's up next, Jason? How about you? Hmm, um, how'd you know you were a type nine? Well, I didn't at first. I, I thought I was a, um, I thought I was a type three at first, oh. and um, kind of uh, how I um, just the way I was experiencing life, you know, and um, the and just working. I work in the entertainment business and music and stuff like that. So that scenery you know, it's so image driven, you know? So, um, 
so I went along to get along, right? You know, and <laughs> image is what it's about, then, you know, I became that. Um, so yeah. I thought I was a three. And um, what made it very clear was my wife. She was just like, no, you're a nine. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, no, I'm not, you know, I don't feel, I, I don't understand. Um, uh, Cause I'm also more conflict leading, leaning, oh, Okay. you know? And I wasn't always that way, but I think I eventually learned that there's also a sweeter harmony on the other side of conflict. And um, it made me, as someone who's harmony driven, it, that's intriguing to me. Mm -hmm. um, and being married to, I, um, being married to my wife, my, who is my high school sweetheart, you know, like I, I learned about conflict pretty early. She leads with a type eight as well. So conflict, it's easy. You know, yeah. like she can do that. Um, so I, I think it took a while for me to start um, making connections, mm. you know, and understanding where I go in stress mm -hmm. and where I go in health. And I, I had to make all these connections because I, I came into the Enneagram at a high point mm. in life and, thing, you know, and, and then I, when the pandemic hit, I was like telling my wife, I was just like, man, I could swear I'm a six. Like, I'm just feeling, you know, my inner alarm triggered, you know? Right. And so um, just kind of all this mapping and all this connection, I was just like, okay, I'm a nine. Yeah. And, um, and I think the, probably the strongest thing about it that I resonate with is going along to get along. Mm. And, yeah. um, that is, and that feeling of like the need to belong, to belong to others too, and um, and feeling like my efforts and my work um, and being a servant in a way is the only way I can maintain that or have that, mm -hmm. you know, and or just something, I, I always feel like love for me is something that's always dwindling almost like a bucket with of water with a hole in it it's always gonna run out and the only way that i can maintain love for me is to is to constantly people please or to merge with others and, and it's it's so comfortable and so easy to to be about the needs of others you know and yeah. You know, so, um, and then of course there is the the um, the animosity, the um, the passive aggressive thing mm -hmm. about it. You know, because it's like if you don't want to cause conflict, right? Then you're less likely to say the things that could provoke it and risk the very thing you want, which is a sense of belonging. So it's, it's easier to just sit on my hard feelings. And, you know, and that's where passive aggressive things starts to happen. And it's, there's only so long you can sit on it, you know, it, it just starts, it wants to seep out, you know, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like I'm talking too long now. Yeah, no, it's so it's funny. So the two things that are coming up for me as you're talking is one, how like one, it's fine to mistype yourself. Like that, that question comes up all the time. You know, when you started as a three, you went to a nine. I thought I was an eight. I now understand that I'm a one, right? So that's a really common thing. I always love to point that out so that people understand it's totally fine to have a journey. And what's interesting too, is I think, um, you know, nines are a body type. Um, in that body triad and, but you're in the middle of uh, between one and eight. And I think ones and eights go fast. We are fast body types. We're like, bup, 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 you know, just always moving. Whereas nines then in the center are like, just, you know, and yeah. so I could even feel within myself as you were talking, like 
and I'm like, nope, what I like, I know that if you can respect how nines move and that like, and, and as you kept talking, just gem after gem after gem, but I had to be patient and wait for you. And so like, not any, and then as you were talking about your Enneagram journey, like it took time you had to go through and you had to talk to different people and you had to see, it's like, that's the pathway that nines need. And if we can respect that, then we are going to have better relationships with nines. You're going to get what you need. I'm going to get, everybody's going to get what they need, <laughs> you know? So yeah. that like, you just demonstrated even how, like, that's the pace of the nines. And we need to kind of understand that they're not being slow. They're not being meandering. You know, you don't have to apologize for how the time it takes to unfold. It's like, that is your unfolding. And, yeah. you know, and that's a beautiful thing, right? In, in fact, it can help all of us bring it down because the pace of American culture is so fast. Like Western world, we are like pop, 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 onto the next thing. And like to have human beings whose natural pace is to slow us down, is like, it's a huge gift. So, and then also just the last thing about the, the triangle, right? That's one of the things I love about the Enneagram is it's a, it's a movement thing, right? You don't just, you're not stuck in one place. This is a, a you know, a, a modality with movement in it, right? So yeah, you're going to sometimes go to your resources from the three resources from the six. And, and it's not about kind of going there without thought. It's, you know, at some point as you work with this, you then learn to have some awareness a, a, around when you're pulling re more resources from the six or more from the three or more from your yeah. home type nine. And that's one of the kind of beautiful things um, about it. So thank you, Jason. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, how about you? How did you know you were a nine? Um, I think I first um, identified as a six. So similar to Jason in that when the first thing I read, or maybe I think the first little test I took even said I was a six. Um, but there was a lot of nine that resonated with me, but just all of the um, like thinking ahead and how to prevent things from happening and just like wanting to manage. So to avoid something bad happening or a failure of something that was definitely me I'm a mom of four kids and so I was always just looking ahead what needed to be done kind of thing but then the more I read about it um I just the nine just really started to resonate with me a lot of just the mediator um I'm in the middle of three girls and um I just remember even growing up um they're both, they just both take the spotlight. I prefer to be in the background. I don't really want to draw attention to myself. Mm -hmm. um, my family used to laugh and say, when my older sister calls me on the phone, they're like, we know it's her because you don't say a word. I mean, she's just talking, <laughs> and, talking and, and I just, I mean, that's kind of the way I am. So when I'm with the two of them, like, I don't say a whole lot, you know, and, but I'm kind of okay with that, you know? And so just that, um, that uh, picture, I, was, I just, that resonated with me as a kid. Like I can remember feeling that way as a kid. And, and but then also the, um, like I, when the two of them were talking or arguing or in a, you know, I knew what each of them was trying to say. And they were, I was like, I could, the seeing the perspectives of other people, I definitely have experienced that a lot. And now as an adult, like in team meetings or different things, it's like, no, I know what you're saying. And I know what you're saying. You guys aren't hearing it, but it's like, I could, so I started to really see that. And I think the interesting thing I would say in the last, um, maybe three years, two, three years, I've really seen kind of the negative side of the nine and how that's played out in my life. I've recently been through a divorce after 26 year marriage and almost how I, like I, and I divorced my husband of 26 years after, but fully believing in marriage. And it was one of those things like I never thought in a million years, this would happen to me, but I realized I'd kind of gone to sleep to some things that 
are not okay, that were not okay with me, you know? And when I finally kind of woke up to it and was like, this is the reality of your life. You cannot ignore this anymore. You know, what are you going to do? And um, so that has been really interesting over the last couple of years, just that making some choices for myself and like putting myself first. And it was a point that it, some things were even affecting my health. And um, like, I often don't feel stressed. Like I, I think people would describe me as someone that's very laid back. I can man, I can handle a lot of stuff. And um, I feel like even just being more in touch with my body um, has been something because I started experiencing pretty severe vertigo when all of this was going on. There was a lot of confusion. I mean, it was just really, really interesting how all of a sudden my body was like, no, we're maxed out here. We cannot handle any more. You need to pay attention to yourself. And um, so it's been a really, I mean, and I am in the thick of it still, like just paying attention to those things and like, I need to take the time to slow down and um, to like not ignore myself, like not just let myself be in the background. And I think as a mom, it's easy sometimes to merge with everyone too, like as just your life stage, I stayed at home. So it was all about just my family, you know? And then it's like, wait a minute, what? So now, I mean, my, my baby just graduated from high school. So I am, it's now just me. And somebody said to me recently, they were like, like empty nesting and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I know, but it doesn't really look like what I thought it would look like now that I'm an empty nester. Cause I thought I'd be married and, you know, and she was like, I know, but I think now the nest is for you. Mm. And I was like, oh, I think mm. that might be true. You know, I mean, and I just love that. And so it's, I'm definitely in a new season and I've gone back to work full time and all those things. Um, but it's kind of like, I think I lost myself a little bit for a season. And so now it's like, what do I like? Mm -hmm. What do I want for my life? And, um, and it's hard. Like I, I have a really close friend and she's the one that actually that's how I found out about this. But anyway, she, I often, I mean, we're together a lot and I'm like, I don't know. Tell me what I feel. She's like, what are you feeling? I'm like, I don't even know. Tell me yeah. like you're good enough. You're close enough to me. You probably know. I, I mean, I have a hard time with that still, you know, like I don't really know what I'm feeling. And so it's, it's definitely been a journey, um, that I'm still on, but I find it super fascinating mm. and it helps me understand a lot like oh I can see where this happened you know and so really interesting mm. yeah you know I I wonder if anybody's ever done any work on like uh kind of w women in midlife and like and and if and if you know their types like Enneagram nine women because there's <clears throat> there's already kind of uh this phenomenon of like women having a big wake-up moment and being like everything's got to change, you know? And often their spouses are like, I didn't know she was unhappy. And, you know, and like, sometimes she didn't even know she was unhappy. Right. And so I wonder if that's more pronounced for somebody who would also be a nine. I don't know. That just is a thought that came up, but right. it, yes, this like awakening to yourself um, and then staying awake is a whole nother thing, right? right. Stay awake to yourself. Um, right. So. I don't know if you, anyone's heard, um, I don't even remember the guy's name, but who wrote all the songs for each Enneagram number. I think oh, the yes. album is called like Sleeping at Last or yeah, something. Yeah, Sleeping at Last is the band is his band name, yeah. Okay, when I heard the nine song, I was driving from North Carolina to Tennessee, dropped my kid off at camp and I was driving to my mom's in Tennessee. I mean, just wept the oh. entire and, that, and he, the guy who wrote it is a nine. Mm -hmm. And he, so I think he spent more time on the nine song. He kind of said that, but I was like, this, he is reading my mail. Mm -hmm. I was just like, mm -hmm. it was really a, a powerful, like just moment. I was just like, yeah, this is me. Mm -hmm. But 
That's anyway. powerful. Yeah. To be seen like that. Yeah. By a stranger. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I would love to talk next about kind of the gifts and strengths of your type. Um, what have you experienced as the gifts or strengths of your type? I'm going to go let my dog outside really quick. Okay. I'm not okay. leaving, but okay. she might start barking if I don't attend okay. to her. <laughs> Kelly, you want to start us off again? Um, I think sometimes I struggle with whether it's a gift or strength. Cause I know, like you said, you know, like the whole being able to see things from both sides. Um, and I think that is, it can be a gift. And I have found myself, um, you know, doing that a lot, you know, say if, if, um, you know, coworkers or, you know, friends are really struggling to understand, to be able to say, okay, well, but have you considered that, you know, this person is coming at it from this way. They're not being malicious. You're just seeing it differently. Um, and I find myself doing that a lot. Um, and it was one of the things that I really realized this is a nine thing to like really want people to understand. I mean, sometimes people are just being malicious and sometimes there's absolutely no excuse for behaviors, but trying to help people understand like, okay, but you need to, you need to be able to see it from this way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and now that I have a teenager, I'm doing that a lot with the teenager and every other member of the family of, you yeah. know, listen, they're just being their age. Like this is, you know, some of the behaviors may not be okay and we need to correct them, but they're just going to be in their age. Let's just let them be. Or have you considered that, you know, because they're this age, that this is how they're interpreting what you're saying. Like, let's maybe try taking a different tactic because they're not hearing you as being loving and kind because, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, teenagers are trying to find themselves and you know, their identity and like everything about it is, you know, that horrible word of, you know, rebellion but I'm like they're not trying to rebel they're just trying to find themselves let's let like is it really that bad let's let them find themselves um but I think even in that so even though it's a strength like what you were saying in the intro with how exhausting it can be mm -hmm. like I found myself a couple of weeks ago saying I'm just tired of talking for everyone mm. like I'm exhausted can I just be mm -hmm. but then it's hard to put it down because there's that whole thing of like, when you're treading water, if you stop treading, what are you going to do? Yeah. You're going to, you feel like you're going to sink and you feel like everyone around you is going to sink as well. And so that's where, um, even though it's a strength and it's something that I absolutely love, like, again, with what you're saying at the beginning with the boundaries, like it's a matter of finding how to use your strengths, mm -hmm. when to use them and when to just let people do things themselves. Yeah. Well, let, me, um, let me ask you a clarifying thing, Kelly. Yeah. When I heard you saying, um, like talking for everybody and like, um, you know, getting people to see each other's points of view, do you feel like you kind of, uh, I don't exactly know how to say it. Like, do you feel like you kind of embody the other person or like you can jump into them and like see it from their eyes or is it, no, I just can really take in lots of information and kind of hold it all. I'm just, and of course this could be different yeah. for three of you, but I'm just wondering your experience of it. For me, it really depends on the situation and the person. There have been times where I know that I, and I know that this is going to move into like the whole, like, you know, woo woo, you know, mystical. Be as woo woo as you want. I, I love know. It. Bring and it. I know with you that it's, it's completely safe, but there's times that I wonder that like in my early twenties, I wonder like, am I psychic? Like, how do I know that this is what that person is thinking and feeling where it's like, I can almost see it not physically. So I'm not going to say that, like, I close my eyes and I can see exactly what that person's seeing, yeah. but it's almost like I can feel myself, like you said, like the embody them and, and see it their, their way. And I think it depends on my connection with the person. Okay. Um, like with my kids, I feel like I can do that with people that are close to me, like my sister, I've been able to see things and feel things the way that she has and be able to really take that on. Like the, for me, like the whole empathy and feeling the way people feel like I have had physical pains mm. that I know other people have experienced that I couldn't have explained it any other way. 
Um, and I don't know how much that is a nineness, like how much that's just being very in tune, like that part, I'm not sure. But yeah, there are times that I'm like, yeah, this is how this is making that person feel like this is the pain yeah. that what you're saying or the pain of them not being heard mm-hmm. is, is bringing out. Yeah. And so then like that also like the, the physical, emotional connection side will get exhausting. But then also when you know, like, this is something that I'm able to bring to the table, it's hard to not yeah. bring it to the table. Yeah. Um, but that's also part of the journey. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, Jason, how about you? What do you feel like those gifts um, and strengths are? Um, hmm, I resonate with every, everything. Um, uh, so, um, well, one thing I also wanted to say, I, I really also relate to what Bonnie said as well about that awakening. Oh man. Uh, I, 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 I was doing a course at the narrative Enneagram on defense mechanisms and the instructor mentioned, um, it's not unheard of for a nine to go along to get along for like 20, 30, 40 years. Yeah. And the, the moment she said that, all the tears came down oh. my face because mm. I immediately knew what that was, mm. what I was falling asleep to. Mm-hmm. And, um, and uh, being, I, I was in a situation that was um, very inequitable yeah. environment and being the only black family in this environment amongst amazingly nice, caring, you know, predominantly white, um, it was definitely white male driven, but a kind of a predominantly white community mm-hmm. and everybody's nice, but it, there's something about the environment that was really painful to me. Mm-hmm. And I, um, I was kind of going along to get along in it. Yeah. And um, for about 20 plus years. Yeah. And so painful. So, um, uh, but I, I just wanted to, you know, add to that part of it. Jason, of- Jason can, I, can I just stop you for a second so I can ask you this. When you had and I don't know if it was an awakening moment or if it was an awakening like process, but like when that came to you, like, how did you know? How did you like, you know, I mean, it's not like awakening, like somebody shakes you awake or, or was it kind of a shaking awake kind of? It, it, how did I know? Cause I was, I, it was an environment. It was a, a church environment and one of the reasons why we started that church was to, um, it was for equity work, for diversity work. And um, it's led by predominantly white males. And just kind of as the church grew, you know, 12 years into it, um, they never followed that vision. Mm-hmm. And um, it was a lot of painful experiences, you know, being the first black friend for many white people. and there's a whole lot of curiosity that comes with that. There's a, you know, people, there's people I met that I was, they didn't like black people until they met me. They were surprised that they themselves liked black people. Mm. I mean, I I would hear things like, man, I've never seen a black person so articulate as you before, Mm. you know, like, and that was just 12 years and in ways 20, because I, there's a team that I worked with. Yeah. Um, prior to that to start this yeah. and I just realized you know and during the pandemic as we're being we're all the kind of racial tension of our country all the the sins of our past it wants to be dealt with you know and so in those situations I realized that and hearing that the thing that I struggled with was um when push comes to shove, it was just eas- easier for that culture to escape. Mm-hmm. They just needed a break from, you know, and I, I, and I was just kind of denying all of that, you know, and everybody's so nice and so kind and have good intentions, you know, that it, it was toxic. That even made it harder, you know? Yeah. So I, I think, 
I was years and years of pain and being told harmful things, just being a zebra. And I just wanted to love through that. You know, that's, I, I, I prioritize that love thing and mm -hmm. unconditional love. And, you know, I can understand where people is coming from. I have compassion for, you know, and I just realized I have to stop doing that. Mm. And because um, it, it put, it, it caused me a lot of pain. It's caused my family a lot of pain. And when you're only, when your girl is only girl in, you know, with, you know, cur kinky curly hair, you know, like k kids who are not used to that, you know, they want to touch it. They want to, there's, you know, all these things. Yeah. And so um, I I'll tie this in with the question about strengths. I think a great strength of, of the type nine is the ability to really see the sides of others and to empathize um to truly see people yeah. you know like you can see someone's brokenness and see so much potential in them yeah. and you can have empathy for the way someone is broken because it's like if they experience a certain pain or a certain loss you find compassion there and it could be overly forgiving and overly accepting um and that's the negative side of it right there is um and you really can see people but it's hard to, I think the negative side is denying oneself, you know, mm -hmm. and yeah. self forgetting and losing balance of loving ourselves as well as others, Yeah, you know, and um, uh, so, so like, and it's, and what's interesting is you, if you are creating more of a people pleasing Type of relationship um we also rob people rob ourselves of the relationship we ideally want mm. you know because because once you i want the one thing i learned about going along to get along and feeling like i need to be a certain way and do certain things in order to be loved is you find out that it, it becomes kind of true mm. you know that relationship end up being built on that, you know, so that when, every time they get around your presence, get around you, they're, it, it's, uh, it's natural for them to want to take or want to, you know, they just get, they get used to that relationship, you yeah. know, so, yeah. um, so my awakening is to, to be okay with taking up space. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. why I'm wearing my my gold hat, you know, like instead of blending in, take up space. Yeah. And um, so that's kind of what I'm learning from my awakening. Um, I'm still in it, you know, and it's tough. Yeah. Well, it's like, you know, you have, nines do have that superpower of like, um, I mean, just really creating harmony and so when you're the different one, you know, when you're the already marginalized one, um, whether that's race, gender, sexuality, whatever, like you're so good at it. And then they that like in a work setting or in a community, people can come to then depend on that. And so now you're like the expert not rocking the boater. And then it's like, it creates a cycle that you can't get out of Absolutely. until you just, one day it's the divorce it's the I'm going to leave this job it's the, all of that you know and again people are like what where did this come from because you're so good at it and you and I loved what you said about seeing all the sides of a person because that I mean that's blowing my mind because I'm like oh wow it's not even about like an argument or a discussion you literally see the potential and like somebody is being mean to you but you're thinking about how they you know, well, they said that one nice thing one time. So I know they got it in them or I've seen them apologize to somebody else so well. I know that they can, you know, or they're accepting of gay people. I know they're going to be, you know, they're going to get the race thing at some point because, because I know, you know, and it's like, you can hold all of that and you, and it's almost like you can get trapped in it. Like what? I just had never thought about that kind of happening in the mind of a nine. That's yeah. incredible. <laughs> so to me, that's like, that's a huge revelation if people can hear that, like 
the way you all can see so much of, of a person is like such a beautiful gift and can keep you in that, like can keep you on the hook with people for years because you're, you're seeing all of that at the same time, even if that's, you know, not, not to say they won't change, maybe they could change or they could, you know, develop all these other pieces of themselves, but that could be 10 years from now, but you kind of can see it all in that person as, as is that's, yeah. that's incredible. Really incredible. Thank you for that kind of really brilliant um, revelation that I don't think we talk about when we talk about nines all the time. Bonnie, what about you? What are you thinking as far as strengths or gifts of your type? Um, I think a little bit about what Jason was saying, like seeing the good and the potential. I think that's one of the things that kept me in my marriage, honestly, for, um, you know, as long as it, I, I kept saying, I would say to my former husband, like, I think I know you better than you know yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes I still really feel that way. Um, and it, it was just, I just, I had this eternal hope and um, I have a, I do have a large capacity, I think, to take on a lot mm -hmm. and to feel people, my friends would kind of describe me as like, you're kind of the calm and the storm. And, and I kind of always have been that way, like not a lot rattles me. And so I feel like I do kind of carry this sense of peace, like, Mm -hmm. I just, I feel it a lot, you know, and even when all hell is breaking loose around me, I still can have this deep sense of peace. My faith is super important to me. It's very easy for me to trust people, mm -hmm. um, which I think is another thing that kept me in a long time because I kept believing some things that, um, that just, you know, probably... 75% of people would have been like, seriously, you know, but I just, um, so, but I do think just seeing the good, um, and just believing that peace, but, but like the shadow side of that, like I, I was afraid to, uh, it's like, I was so comfortable. I didn't want to the alternative of mm. me bringing everything up yeah, and really maybe drawing the line in the sand as far as a boundary, like this actually isn't okay. I was, I was afraid to do that for so long, you know, and so I, I just didn't. And that's wanting to be comfortable and keep the peace was so strong. So that's good in some ways, you know, but then the shadow side of that was just very much like, just was too, too much, you know, for too long. And so I, um, for me, it took like a bomb dropping in my lap to where it was one of those, like no denying it was, it had to be that like cut and dry for me to be able to say, okay, that's it. You know, I'm not okay with this. And, um, whereas that might not have been the case for other people, but for me, it was that, but I, I think, I think just that peace, I don't know. I just, that peace, 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 peace <laughs> is so, um, strong for me. And I feel like it is a gift, you know, that I can't kind of carry as I go. And, um, I'm grateful for that. And I feel like I can step into a situation with somebody else and just kind of be that steady, you know, I don't get ruffled, like what, how we, what are we going to do? How are we going to work through this? Let's, you know, and so I feel like that's a strength. Yeah. Well, um, I want to just check in and make sure everybody's okay with going maybe like a few minutes over. Does everybody have some time to do that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. because I want to go back to something you said, Bonnie, and invite the other two into it because you talked about how, well, you, you kind of said it in a different, in different ways, but like, you know, how you feel peaceful most of the time and, and you can carry a lot of stuff and your body got your attention finally that like, while you felt peaceful, you, 
your bot, your body was obviously sending you lots of signals, right? Like right. The, the actual right. messages from your survival brain were like, we're not okay. We're in <laughs> danger. This is not good. Yeah. And not listening. So guess what, vertigo? Congratulations. And, yes. You know, like horrific. Yes. I've, I've had that happen too as a body type, like who suppresses everything that isn't good or right. My body had to scream at me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, eights tend to like, or be real in touch with their life force. So there's a lot of like, you know, and they can kind of, uh, like when body signals happen, they can negotiate those and navigate those, but they also can ignore them. if It doesn't kind of fit with the like powerfulness. Right. Right. So, but nines, I think like if we can touch into how this works for nines about the kind of self forgetting. So there's peace on the surface, but there's like a lot of maybe body stuff going on. So I don't know. I just wondered if, and you don't have to, but Kelly or Jason, if you had anything to kind of add to what Bonnie's talked about with this body stuff and, and like, you know what I'm saying? Your body trying to get your attention. Has that come up for either of you? Is, is that feel familiar what she's talking about or not so much? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I literally, part of my coming to a, this awakening I, I burnt out so much overworking and all that kind of stuff for that same organization. And I got to the point where I literally could not stand up without complete busy. Mm. Like that vertigo was, I couldn't wash plates. I'm just like, wow, my body is like saying, wow, you can't, you can't just not just work but you can't do chores right now. Mm -hmm. You have to lay down. Wow. And that was, um, so, so yes, that is, I can relate to that. Wow. And uh, Polly, another thing I would add, how at least how I describe um, like what it feels like in my body. Um, uh, I have this image of a boat on water mm -hmm. and I can, I'm always trying to keep my waters calm like that's my goal, you know, but I, that empathic thing feels like, you know, someone speeding across water and moving my water, yeah. you know, like it, <laughs> and I'm like, ah, oh. so when I think of conflict, when I think of the demands place, you know, the big thing with nines is there's an awareness of demands being placed upon you, yeah. even unspoken ones, you know, and the best way I would describe it is like a boat on water and I want my water to stay calm. Yeah. You know, and so it's like, ah, conflict, uh, or. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if it's like, um, like I did the paddle boarding and it's like mm -hmm. when, if a boat goes, when you're paddle boarding, it's like, <laughs> cause now you're getting the wake from the boat and it's like, <laughs> oh man. Figure out how to stay up. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, man. Kelly, what about you? Any thoughts on this? Yes. So I actually found out when I was in my twenties, I had no idea that I had anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. I knew from a child that I had a heart murmur and, you know, so I had seen a cardiologist from the time I was little, you know, and it was just a physical thing. But then when I got into my twenties and started working and I was newly married and you know, all of that, I thought I was having heart attacks. Like I thought that my heart was, you know, cause they always told me that like with my murmur, it could either completely go away or it could get really bad. And so I was at the ER like monthly and getting frustrated that they're like, there's nothing wrong with you. Like your EKG is fine. Like we find nothing physically wrong with you. And I'm like, these doctors have no idea what they're doing. Like I'm in pain. And then finally someone was like, um, Kelly, have you considered the fact that you have anxiety and you're having panic attacks? Wow. I'm like, but I'm not stressed. What do I have to be stressed about? Like, I had no idea that I was even like, I had so little self-awareness, hmm. no idea. And I went through a spell. We were moving from one city to another and we had to keep like going out because, you, know, you know, with, you know, buying, you know, signing contracts and whatnot. This was, you know, pre, you know, oh, email it to me era. Um, yes, we had to physically send it. And every time we drive out, I would have to pull over to the side of the road and vomit. 
Wow. And people are like, are you okay? Like, what's wrong? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. They're like, wipe the mouth off. Great. Everything's yes. fine. Everything's fine. And it was about that time that the friend was like, mm. you're having chest pains. You're throwing up when you've got a major thing going on. Let's consider maybe. And so it was that my body was sending all these signals saying, hey, hello, I'm here. And I'm like, no, no, everything's fine. Like, and seriously, like with the whole, like, I did not want to be a bother to anyone. Mm -hmm. So I'd be like, just pull over. I would grab a napkin, throw up, get back in the car. I'm like, no, we can keep going. It's fine. I'm fine. I have no idea what you're talking about. And yeah. So now that I've gotten better about that, like I'm, I've learned, you know, to breathe. I've learned to, you know, meditate, to do yoga, but even still sometimes like, you know, even as you, you know, started, you know, this session, there's times that I'll realize that whoever may be leading, you know, the, the guided meditation or whatever, they'll say, you know, pay attention to what you're feeling and I'll have to go, oh, right. My body feels things yeah. like it's a literal conscious choice that I have to make to go. I'm going inside now. Mm-hmm. Like I'm going to, I'm going to focus on me. Like as much as I pay attention to others. And one of the other things that has helped, there's a podcast that I listened to a couple of years ago and they were talking about how nines tend to relove peace. And so if there's a true conflict that we have to deal with, we'll deal with it tomorrow. Like we're the, the procrastinators of conflict and whoever was leading the, the conversation was like, but you're still going to have to deal with the conflict. Yeah. The conflict will still be there. You're just ignoring it. Yeah. And then somewhere in the podcast that we're also talking about choosing artificial peace Mm, yeah. And that was an awakening for me of like, as much as I don't like conflict, as much as I don't want to deal with making people mad, I'm instead accepting as much as I say that I love peace, I'm accepting a false mm. peace yeah. because I'm not at peace within myself because even though the waters look great, there's a whole lot of turmoil going on underneath for me to make it look like it's okay. And I'm aware there's this conflict here that I need to deal with, but I'm not. So I'm just going to accept fake peace. And then here I am. So it's something that I've been conscious that I'm not going to say that I've gotten great at it, but I'm trying to get a lot better at it of when there's conflict that I'm tempted to kick down the line to go, okay, is future me going to hate me (laughs) for this? And how much turmoil and false peace am I giving myself in this? And I found that since doing that, I'm getting fewer body effects. Oh, interesting. Um, I'm not going to say it's perfect, um, but it's getting better. And I'm enjoying more knowing that while in the moment I'm dealing with the conflict and I'm the one bringing about the conflict, that eventually it's going to bring about a more true peace. Yeah. Um. It's almost like, how can I give future, how can I give peace to future Kelly? Exactly. Like, that's the gift that you can give yourself today. If you, if you have the resources to do that, you know? Yeah. Well, uh, I want to wrap it up with one final question. That's quickly becoming my favorite question, um, in panels. And it is how can we others, other types love type nines? Well, Um, I feel like maybe for me, I would say almost like the reminding me that I do matter and that I, um, like my thoughts matter, my ideas matter, my physical self matters. Mm -hmm. Um, and like this friend I have, you know, she will she will ask me on a regular basis, what do you need? Mm -hmm. And I often say, I don't know because I don't. And so she'll help me dig down, you know, like, okay, well, is it practical? Is it emotional? Is it, you know? And so just having that person that's like reminding me that I don't have to forget myself. I don't, I don't need to go to sleep to myself. I don't need to forget myself and just like I said, I'm happy being in the background, quite frankly. I don't, and, and it's 
but every now and then I might need to come into the spotlight a little bit, you know what I mean? To take care of myself. And so um, I feel like that's kind of the season I'm in right now. It's just that maybe reminding myself that I'm worth, you know, stepping forward and maybe putting the attention on me mm. in order to take care of myself. Mm. I think that's kind of where I am right now. Mm. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Anybody else? Um, I guess I'll go. Um, I, I, I would echo the same thing. It's, um, I want to know that I belong to others you know, mm -hmm. and that I'm theirs, you know, um, it's it's easy it's easy to help and to it's i it's easy to help people feel as though they belong in that they like it's hard to to you know it's i don't know if i could say i've cut off a friendship before mm. you know like i'm so easily forgiving mm -hmm. so easily want people and my friends to know that they matter to me, that their very presence, what they think, you know, just if you're upset, what bothers you matters to me, mm -hmm. you know, and I think I'm learning that. I think that's what I want, you know, is yeah. that, you know, that I matter when I'm, you know, I, I, I understand how these wings over there are operating. I used to try to, I'm like, how is this one wing operating in a way? And there's this sense of like, um, like vulnerability feels like, do I get to be a slow processor and it be okay? Do I get to, you know, like, I think, I, I feel like with nines, the idea that we don't know what we want is not necessarily true. Hmm. I think there are other things at play. Yeah. And, um, like, I'm like, do you, are you willing to wait around? Are mm -hmm. you willing to, um, cause there may be things we're deciding between. Yeah. And, and you just, once I hear that, you know, TikTok people and patients happening, it's just like, I don't know. It is just easier to, yeah. Cause I, it, but to know that someone's wants to wait, you know, like, mm -hmm. how are you doing? I'm like, I'm fine. People are like, no, I'm, I'm here to wait, to listen to your, you know, so that sense that our entire being, our presence um, matters. And, you know, that is, uh, makes my day. Mm. Thank you for sharing that, Jason. Yeah, these, these are things that are like deceptively simple, but they're really not. Like showing someone they matter, as both you and Bonnie have talked about now, is like it takes practical things. It takes being willing to be taken off your time schedule or the way, you know, how fast you move or, you know, whatever. It's like, it actually requires a change in behavior to show someone they matter to you. And so it's, you know, it's really helpful to hear that um, so that I can have like, oh, am I doing that for the nines in my life? Like that it's, it's a helpful reminder. Kelly, how can we love you well as a type nine? I think a lot of it for, at least for me as a nine, it has to do with feeling seen and heard mm -hmm. because I think nines, we spend so much time. And I think this goes along with what Bonnie and Jason have said already that I know I'm echoing it a lot, but I think because we spend so much time really listening to and tuning ourselves into those in our life mm -hmm. that it's nice to have them turn and really hear us mm -hmm. you know kind of like you know what you know they were both saying you know, to have that friend who you know, like bonnie said is you know but what do you need no what do you need or you know to have you know like jason said a friend who says you know how are you but no really how are you mm -hmm. and you know to make us really feel seen and heard and that it's okay for us to take up that space and to say, yeah, I'm not great. And I need, I need to be heard or I'm doing really great. And I want to tell you all the things. Cause I think at least for me as a nine, um, 
you know, I tend to want to hear all of my friends' stuff, all of my family members' stuff, and I don't always take the time to share about me. And so it's really nice when someone will stop and, you know, just say, no, I, I want to know what's, what's here that, to make me feel heard and seen, that it goes on with me, like what Jason was saying, and make me feel like I belong, that I'm not just here for you, but that I belong for you as well. Yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I just think that's so precious to know what really um, makes someone feel loved. Um, So it's precious when it's shared and then when others are given the opportunity to act on it. So thank you for sharing that, um, all of you. And thank you for sharing about what it's like to be a type nine. I know I learned some things today. You may have even learned some things about yourself. And I know people will learn from um, hearing your stories. Um, so thank you so much for being a part. It's really great. Thanks y'all. Thank you.